Well, our next presenter is none other than president of SEIU Local 1000, Ms. Yvonne Walker. For more than 20 years, Yvonne Walker has dedicated her life to serving the people of California through public service. In May of 2008, she broke racial and gender barriers to become the first African-American woman president of SEIU Local 1000. Currently, President Walker is also a vice president on SEIU International Executive Board. Yvonne developed her leadership skills in US Marine Corps, where she learned the importance of discipline, dedication, and unity of purpose. Yvonne is highly sought after participating in conversation about moving ideas into action all over the globe. She has participated on boards as varied as SEIU International Futures Committee, which assembles the most innovative minds in the world to talk about their vision for the future and strategies. She also is a retirement investment board. Her leadership has won her awards from organizations like Coalition of Labor Union Women and has won her the trust of 96,000 members of SEIU. Yvonne presently lives in El Grove. She was raised in San Diego. So without further ado, I present to you, Madam President Yvonne Walker. Yvonne, floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Bobby. And um, thank you for the um, invitation uh, to talk to uh, the committee and everybody on. I, you know, this is uh, such a, uh, an auspicious year, I didn't realize, but uh, this is the, the 30th anniversary, anniversary um, of the American with Disabilities Act and the 75th anniversary of National Disability Employee Awareness Month. Um, and so I, I think it just adds a little, um, a little more weight uh, uh, to the meeting. Uh, before I go on, I do want to thank Bobby for the invitation. I want to thank Bobby for his leadership. When he talks about me, um, it's a little biased. I think, and I appreciate it because uh, Bobby is one of the members um, that we do represent. He's a leader in Local 1000, and it is always good to see um, our leaders when they're exercising their leadership, not necessarily in their union, but outside their union also. It goes along with our motto that, um, you know, if you develop leaders, they can take you wherever you need to go, and Bobby has certainly um, done that. So I just want to talk about a few things, um, and then I don't um, be available for, for questions if you wanted or something like that. Um, and so um, I should just say in context, in Local 1000, we have um, several what we call human rights committees, and among them are is our accessibility committee, and their charge is to make sure that they're looking at policies um, and making suggestions for policies for workers that might have disabilities to make sure that workers with disabilities have the same opportunity to promote um, and take advantage of everything that state service has to offer. Um, we also uh, made sure in the last uh, couple of years of hiring in our legal department um, a senior attorney who had um, who came with a background of experience um, in disability rights issues because we found that that was an area that we were not necessarily um, covered well in. Um, and so I would just say one of the first things when I became president, and I will say I was um, I'm embarrassed to say I, I was ignorant, you know, of different things that, um, you know, related to people with disabilities, right, and different challenges. I just, it was not in my frame of reference. 
Um, but fortunately, we had a leader in Local 1000, Paula Jane, um, and she made sure that she brought me up to speed things that I didn't take into consideration when we were um, putting information on our website or when we, were, when we were having trainings, making sure that the fonts were right and the background material didn't make it hard, you know, for people who might, you know, visually have a hard time seeing things and taking all of those things um into consideration. Um, in addition, one of our activists that is on our bargaining team um, is from the School for the Deaf in Riverside. Prior to becoming president, we didn't make it a, a routine function to, to close caption all of the videos and everything that we did. And she pulled me aside and said, like, hey, Yvonne, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure the videos are great, but we can't participate in them in the way that everybody else can. And so we've made it a, a practice in the local to make sure that not only do we do the closed captioning, but we don't have a meeting that not that our members, that all of our members can't participate in fully. Um, and so um, I've, you know, it's, it was just a, a wake up for some things that um, I know that I took for granted, but I know that Others do also. Um, we are always looking to protect workers' rights um, in the workplace, right? That is one of the core things um, that we do, making sure that there is a safe environment, making sure that people can come in and do the work that they were hired for without additional obstacles being placed in their way. Um, and so that's just one aspect uh, of things that we do. Um, one of the other things that we do is making sure as uh, the state goes through different changes, challenges, and everything else right now, we all know we're in the COVID-19 challenge, which has put uh, a major stress on the state budget as a, as a result. Um, we had to negotiate a side letter with the state of California, um, and um, I am proud to say that even though that there was, you know, with the PLP 2020, um, which equates to a 9.23% um, cut for people, having the opportunity to negotiate mitigation efforts for that so that nobody would actually feel the effect of 9.23%. And while we were not able to um, wipe out the effects of all the cuts, I think that we have done, we did some good things. For example, the $260 healthcare stipend that we um, negotiated in the, our contract negotiations for people who were the primary um, beneficiary, uh, not beneficiary, the primary um I lost my word and I apologize. The primary person who got health care through the state. Um, we were able in our mitigation negotiations to actually um, expand that so that if you were eligible for health care um, through CalPERS, then you got the $260 a month. Um, and that was, I think, um, something uh, that was very huge um, to have happen. Um, and, um, and then one of the things that we do a lot of is making sure that we're protecting our pension. You know, our pension always comes under a lack, um, through, um, um, the initiative process or in different places and just making sure that, um, CalPERS is going to be around. It is one of the strongest pension funds in the world. Um, I'm proud to be a part of it. And one of the ways in which we did that also, though, is sometimes the work that we do is not always a direct and straight line. Um, supporting um, SB 1234, which created CalSavers, it was put forward by the pro tem, um, uh, Kevin uh, DeLeon at the time. And we supported that because we understood that just having pensions for state workers was not going to be enough. And as long as the general public had no access to a secure retirement fund or a way to save for it, 
our pensions were always going to be in jeopardy. Um, I'm proud to be a member of the Cal Sabres board um, with the work that we're doing to ensure that over 6 million Californians have access um, to retirement savings so that they don't have to retire in poverty um, or continue working until they die. So that's just some of what um, that of what we do, and, and um, I hope that was helpful. And I got to tell you, Zoom meetings for me are extremely hard. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is Susan. Uh, do we have anybody that would like to ask Yvonne any questions? I don't see any in the um, text chat, but you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask Yvonne a question. Yvonne, this is Bobby. I, I just have a follow-up question to what you just said. Uh, is it true that SEIU Local 1000 have uh, contractual text that was ratified, which particularly offers a couple of things to the members, one of which a dignity clause, which affords a person with disabilities the dignity that they need, and the secondarily, there is provision protection in place now that I understand also protect people that requires reasonable accommodation and with a person with disabilities. Could you speak to that a bit? Absolutely. So um, our dignity clause came about came into our contract in um, 2001. I call it our Michael Rubin uh, provision because Michael Rubin, who is a member of the Unit Four bargaining team brought forward that language um, with the, it, it just addressed the proposition that every worker who comes to work should be treated with dignity and respect. And too often, some of the things that we were finding that employees had um, complaints about on the job was the way that they were being treated. And while that might not have been an actual violation of a particular contract section, to be able to codify that employees are, be, are, are, are to be treated with dignity and respect was a huge um, win, um, and we have used it effectively um, since having it since 2001. And also, we made the conscious decision to move um, reasonable accommodation, um, places where you could do... Um, if you feel like you're being discriminated against and everything else, or you could actually file a grievance over it. And the reason why we did that is that it made it um, sometimes a little faster than going through the regular process through um, the FEH or the state personnel board, because what our members told us at the time was they just wanted the problem to be fixed, right? They, they just wanted a quick way to have, the, the problem uh, fixed. Yvonne, it does look like we um, have a question from Levi Goldman. Yvonne, what is being done for upward mobility for those with disabilities? I understand there is a 2020 program, yet this not, was not available for my bargaining unit number one. Uh, yes, and so um, here is the work that uh, we've been doing. One, um, trying to get away from uh, the term upward mobility because that has a very distinct definition and it is limited on the classifications that it gets offered to. And so through the last contract cycle, we've been talking more about career mobility, right? Because career mobility doesn't is not um, dependent upon what bargaining unit um, that you're in. I will be honest with you, it has been an uphill fight um, and an uphill battle um, to, um, to move the state's thinking as they think about um, career mobility. I, I believe that we will have another opportunity as we, that will be one of the, the things that could come out of um, this pandemic um, because I think we're going to have to look at how we do our work. It's not going to be done the same. I don't believe it's going to be done the same in the future. Um, we opened up telework overnight, practically, when years before that, 
Um, there were all the reasons why we couldn't telework. Well, now we have, and we have figured out a way to do it. Now we have to figure out a way how to operationalize it in a very real way. And I think it's going to change the way we do work, how we do work, and the way, you know, people get supervised and then. But it is, it is a constant fight and it is an uphill fight because it is changing thoughts and minds and it is changing cultures. But it is a fight that we are ready to take on. So, Yvonne, um, this is Susan. I actually have a personal question about that same topic. Um, as you can tell, we have this XStat group. We're very active. You have a lot of passionate people. Are there any ways that we can um, network or assist um, in kind of work with SCU um, to either keep you guys in the loop or um, to help with the progress of these issues? Because, I mean, we're all aware that it, it takes Absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> you are singing my tune, Susan. We would absolutely love that. As I said, we do have our accessibility committee. Beth Bartell is the chair of that committee, and I can make sure through Bobby that we get you the information you need. But imagine how much more powerful we would be if we were working together towards the same goal. Um, we have a couple more. Qu- well, before we get into a couple more questions, we'd like to. Would anybody like to unmute and ask um, Yvonne a question um, through audio before I I dive into more uh, text quest- te- questions in the chat? This is Beth Bartell. Actually, thanks for the mention. Chair of our committee. Yay. Hi. I didn't want to speak up and introduce myself. I didn't want to commandeer anything, but thank you. Um, I am asking Ms. Walker to um, promote SEIU Local 1000's online reporting form for the Accessibility Committee. I see questions in the chat. Would love to have your questions regarding accessibility and disability rights in the workplace for state workers, especially those that we represent, um, reported to Local 1000 using that form so that we can have a record of it and track it. Beth, if you would like to put that um, the link in the chat, that's one way that we can share. And then you could also make sure that um, if you get it to Bobby, we can um, include it in a follow-up email. I will um, do so. Thank you. And then um, I do have from Alex, I have a question. Alex, uh, I'm going to get your name wrong. <laughs> will SEU, SEIU be looking forward to effects of COVID on to unto members after 2020 wraps up. I only ask because to my knowledge, there are protections in place right now that go away at the end of 2020, such as EFMLA and EPSL, EPS, yeah. Also teleworking and logistics, perhaps a broad question, and maybe can you try to keep in the vein of the event? It's a, it's a lot of information there, but let's focus on, um, will you be looking into um, uh, how, how this all changes, 2020 wraps up, and the, the, the things that are going away? Uh, yes. So the, the EFMLA is a federal program, um, and we all know the state of what's going on at the federal gov- government level right now. So I don't anticipate till after the election um, that they look at anything if they look at expanding it. But we also, though, we um, continue to um, push and negotiate with the state on protections um, for our employees because the, the, the effects of COVID-19 are not going to arbitrarily end December 31st of 2020. Um, this is going to be ongoing long into 2021. You know, um, the kids are still not back in school. People still have health conditions. We're expecting a, a, a second surge. So making sure that um, everybody that we represent um, is protected in the best way that we know how is the work that we are continuing to do. Ms. Steve, sorry. Yvonne, I have a question. It's Robin Blackwell from DFH. Hey, Robin. Hi, sorry. There's like, they're doing some tree work in the background. So I just have a question. When you, um, when people file a grievance as it relates to disability and a disability accommodation, do your reps um, go through any training as it relates to facilitating a reasonable accommodation so that when they're having meetings, they're able to address some of the work conditions and the reasonable accommodation that the employee is looking for. 
And then also my other question is, is that in the grievance process, when you guys are taking notes, do you give that to the reasonable accommodation unit um, so that they know that engagement in the interactive process has taken place regarding the employee's uh, request for reasonable accommodation? Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna answer. So yes, um, yes, the reps are trained. But here's the thing: unless you're using this all of the time, you can have training and then you know forget of what your training um, is. Which is why we made sure in our legal department we hired somebody with that was their um, specialty, um, so that we that was not their, their specialty, their area, their area of law that they specialized in. Um, to make sure that um, we were not leaving a gap um, for the employees that we represent. And I think I heard the second part of your question, do we provide our notes to the department? Any notes, because at an investigative standpoint, if I'm looking to see if the, the, the department engaged in an inactive process, a lot of the notes that I'm getting don't come from the grievance process where you guys are discussing items like, you know, the employees work restrictions or what is thought about as a reasonable accommodation or what people are looking for in terms of like the supervisor, the employee and the job function. So are you guys providing this to the units? We do not provide that to the department that we are interactive acting with. But if I, heard you correctly, I thought you said you were at DFEH. If there, if you were investigating something and you had a question and you contacted us, um, we would certainly interact with you, yes. Perfect. Robin, this is Bobby here. I just have a follow-up question to what you just uh, alluded, presented to Yvonne. And that is, is, uh, is your agency or your department provide any kind of resource and way of training either uh, interact and available uh, resource uh, to SEIU Local 1000 or to SDAC. Yeah, so that would be something that Brandon Butler would be handling because he's education and outreach. So right now um, with the COVID and how to handle COVID, that's at the forefront. Before that was the ban the box with new employers. Um, with having it on the application, with asking uh, questions, with posting advertisements that say um, uh, clean record, uh, anyone with a felony do not apply, um, those type of things. But I will talk to him specifically about what the best practices are in terms of engaging in the interactive process, letting an employee know what the expectations are for a supervisor and themselves, right? So notice medical substantiation, being timely, um, considering all reasonable accommodations, um, ensuring that the accommodation is effective, right? The employee's obligation to say whether or not there are certain work restrictions that aren't being put on the medical documentation that the employer uh, didn't think of, right? Or the essential work functions in terms of saying like, you know, I have an inability to bend, but the printer is located here, which, you know, which means that I'll have to bend. Can we please move it up? Which is the, uh, you know, reasonable accommodations that have no expense, right? Or I need to test my blood sugar, right? So I need to do it more often. And then we can talk about, okay, well, we can break up your 15 minute breaks to five minute breaks. Therefore, it's no cost to us. You have three additional breaks throughout the day. So I will talk to him about that just so that, you know, uh, because again, like uh, Miss Yvonne said, you don't know unless you're there at the table, right? And you have to be at the table on a consistent basis. But because so many people have different needs, um, you know, it's a challenge, you know, versus in my profession where I see them all the time, right? There's a little bit more of a, a expertise that's developed. Great. Thank you. And if I understand correctly, you're an investigator with DFEH, correct? I'm an investigator, but I've also processed reasonable accommodations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin. Hi, this is uh, Sean Whelan uh, from the Department of Healthcare Services. I have a question actually for Yvonne. Um, I, I've heard, you know, different things about the interactive process with uh, when it comes to reasonable accommodations. 
And it's all the documentation that I've been able to locate is very vague in explaining what what does the interactive process really mean? Because I, I've seen where some people will, a supervisor will send an email and say, you know, the, the employee asked for a reasonable accommodation. And then the supervisor comes back and says, no, we can't uh, meet that. Thank you. So to me, that's not an interactive process. So is there somewhere that's documented that, that shows what does that mean? What does that interactive process mean? Is there steps that, that you know, identify that? Right. right. Well, I will say, Sean, you are outside my area of expertise um, it, with, with your specific question. But I agree with you. For me, an interactive process is not I've put in a request and you've emailed me back and say, no, I can't accommodate that. Mm -hmm. The interactive process is, that you sit down, you talk it through, you understand what it is the person needs and, and where they're trying to get to. It is not supposed to be a pro forma thing that, well, we're, we're checking a box to say that we've done this. It really is supposed to be um, back and forth and, and before an employer can make the determination that, no, we can't accommodate that. And it's my belief that most things can be accommodated. Right. And, and Sean, I, I just want to interject. There are a couple more speakers, one of which is Paula Tobler, who is an attorney with the Disability Rights California, can speak to your specific concern and explain in detail the legalities of what that constitutes. So if you want to reserve your question to that point, that'll be great. Yeah, that, yeah that's awesome. Because to me, you know, just in my, and, and when I'm thinking about the interactive process, it's it's back and forth until both parties can come to a mutual agree upon accommodation that's going to meet the department's goals as well as the, the employee's um, disability and need. And, you know, I mean, I have looked out. There's the different things. I've shared it with some of the people in our um, department. It's the JAN network, job area, um, job accommodation network that has a lot of great stuff in there. So. Just go, just Google it and you can find it. Thank Does anybody you, use that that I'm aware of? Does anybody else look to that? Yeah, we had a presentation recently on Jan. I, I believe you missed that at the SDAC uh, right. last cool. event. But anyway, thank you for bringing it up and please reserve your question for the expert in the reasonable accommodation who's coming up, a couple of speakers. Uh, and Bobby, we actually have one. Do, do we have time for one more question? Because I do have one more in the text. I'm going to ask uh, Madam President to decide. Do we have, do you have a little more time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank so um, Tina Seville asks, uh, once a grievance is filed, is there a statute of limitations enforced or does SCIU address each grievance on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the severity of the case? So, no, there is not a statute of limitations. There are timelines for each stage um, of the grievance process. Um, but so, you know, it starts out at the lowest level with your supervisor, moves up to your department director level, then on to CalHR, and then, you know, decisions get made on whether it gets um, arbitrated or not. So, no, there is no statute of limitations because... Theoretically, through each stage of the process, we're supposed to work towards resolution if possible. So sometimes, you know, they uh, can get settled very quickly. And sometimes they can take, um, if it goes all the way to arbitration, it can take uh, years. Um, it's not unusual for it to be two to three years and sometimes longer before resolution. And part of that is once it gets to the attorneys and the the back and forth of the process, and then there's no, um, we've had cases where an arbitrator um, has taken, you know, three years before they issued their ruling. Thank you. It looks like that's all the questions we have in the text. Um, yeah. Anybody else has any questions for Madam President? If not, uh, then I'm going to express my gratitude to Yvonne Walker.
I'm so glad that you reserved a few minutes to field questions. Uh, your answers were very insightful and we appreciate you being here. Hopefully you'll come back and present again at SDAC. And once again, thanks for your generous gift of time. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Same here.